So, so welcome everyone to join this today's session. Today we are gonna talk about Quark to see how we can use Quark to do Kubernetes scheduling test revolution only. Firstly, a little bit about ourselves. My name is Wei Huang. I work for Apple in the Apple service engineering team. In the upstream, I'm the co-chair of SIG scheduling. I'm also the maintainer of some scheduling plugin of some Kubernetes sub projects like scheduling plugins and Quark. Uh, my name is Weiwei Yang. I'm also from Apple, uh, working in the AML data infrastructure. And I'm uh, EXVP of Apache Unicorn. Um, and also, I love Kubernetes and open source. I've worked on many, many open source projects before. So today's agenda is three parts. First of all, we will get you to know what's Kubernetes scheduling test as what's current state. And secondly, we will see how we can use Quark to solve the scheduling test point in a little different angle. The lastly, we will share how in reality, how Quark helps Unicorn to uh, load its scalability test. The first part, what is Kubernetes scalability test? So it's the term scalability test sounds a little scare. You may be panic when you hear the term, but by its different definition, is nothing but see how your components respond along with the number change of your Kubernetes API objects. So it can be multidimensional. You can be, it can be nodes change, can be power change, can be service change, and points change, PVP, et cetera. And also can be a particular uh, combination that you care most. For, for example, for Istio, maybe you care most about how the endpoints, endpoint size, et cetera, how it works like, or it's related. Uh, CR objects. So why this is important? Because I think most of the company right now are into a day two world of running Kubernetes. So for day two, it's a master to measure the component, to be assured you know the limits and the boundary of your application running there. And then so you can pre-plan your capacity and so that you can control the cost and also your user know the limits, so they can plan the application as well to know the limits and get the best user experience. So in practice, how we do scalability testing in Kubernetes context, uh, over -sim simplified paradigm is like this. We should have the data inputs. The data inputs is nothing but a series of uh, workloads, but you may not choose the raw vanilla YAML files, describe all the nodes, all the parts, et cetera. Maybe you choose some tools help you abstract that workloads. And it also help you orchestrate in a time window, like uh, how you describe a scenario to deploy 5,000 nodes and deploy uh, 10K parts and see how, how the server lo looks like. Then in the market, there are some existing open source tool like Cluster Loader 2. Uh, it's maintained by SIG scalability. And it can offer a YAML-based directory for you to describe uh, what kind of workloads orchestration will look like. So once you have the input, you just put the data into the Kubernetes cluster. We will get back later about how we compose, spin up the Kubernetes cluster later, and then you run the workloads, you wait for the workloads to complete, and then you collect the data output. So the data output can be metrics, can be log, can be anything you care about, and then you do the analysis and show you that. You can also leverage the existing famous uh, observability tools like Prometheus Grafana, and also you can uh, build a custom dashboard. So let's take a look at Kubernetes cluster. An obvious, a straightforward idea is, yeah, it's nothing but the Kubernetes cluster, I just run the real cluster, right? That's right. In the upstream CI suite, there is a job is to spin up 5,000 GCP nodes. You may be a little surprising, but it does yes, exist, this kind of 5,000 GCP real nodes test. But the interesting thing is that in the uh, right top, it says run on all days. You may be wondering why it run all days? Why not run, why, why, why it doesn't run every day and why it doesn't even run maybe every few hours or 
just upon the PRs merge, right? The answer is also obvious. That's a lot of money. You spin out 5,000 nodes, VM, right? That's a lot of money. Even upstream cannot afford. And also, you have to wait for the cluster to real be up, and also destroy it can be non-trivial uh, work. And then the third limitation is that you are restricted to the cloud offerings SKUs. You cannot config arbitrary SKUs like how many CPU and memory you want. So this kind of three limitations. Yes, this kind of test does have some value, especially you want to cover the end end from MPI object creation to the uh, kubelet. So it does exist to have value, but in most of the time, if you want to test the Control plane only components is way too much to be affordable. So for control plane only components, usually we run simulated Kubernetes cluster. There is a tool called KubeMark, which is short for Kubernetes benchmark. So basically this essential idea is that I don't want to really run the kubelet because I don't care about the runtime behavior, I care about the control plane behavior. So the essence is, I will implement the minimum Kubla interface and wrap it up as a hollow node. And that hollow node talks to the API server to represent itself as a node. So that if you want to compose 5,000 nodes, you just spin up 5,000 hollow nodes, the, the binaries, and the, you will get a fake 5,000 nodes cluster. Let's use a diagram to illustrate. So firstly, you have to have a control plane you want to test against. If you're not caring about the control plane, just just upstream one and uh, prompt your specific component, for example, a CRD controller, you want to test it. So this is the target you want to test with. And then you don't have nodes, right? So you will spin up this kind of hollow nodes. And those hollow nodes, as I mentioned earlier, will register themselves as a fake kubelet, and then talk to the API server in the uh, target cluster. But this kind of hollow nodes, as mentioned, does need compute resource. They're not coming for free. You have to have a concrete physical place to run this kind of hollow nodes. So usually, uh, you, a popular pattern is you have, you have to have a, another Kubernetes hosting cluster. They are real clusters. And then these hollow nodes in the context of hosting cluster is nothing but individual part. They are not no. They're just a part, be scheduled as usual. And then in the right part, the yellow part consists of the hosting cluster. But in the left part, themselves, when talking to the control plane, they are no. So this sounds a little complex, but yes it does. That is why it has this is the pinpoint of the complexity. So the other pain point is that it doesn't come for free. It consumes resource. The initial memory free print for each hollow node is 100 megabytes. So if you want to compose a 5,000, that means you have to have 500 gigabytes uh, to prepare for this kind of testing. That is not trivial resource, I would say. Maybe you have to have a hosting cluster for 100 nodes, maybe, to simulate it. Uh, 500, 5,000 nodes tests. So how we can make it better? So that is the motivation of the project Quark. In this part, we will share what is Quark and why it's performing and how it's distinguished in terms of design philosophy to other frameworks like QMark. So Quark is a short for Kubernetes without Kubelet. So you may, may be super confusing about term without kubelet. But believe it or not, you may be already using it without noticing it. For example, if you're an upstream de developer, when you write an integration test, it doesn't spin up kubelet. It just spin up API server and ACD and the particular components you want to test with. Also for M test, maybe you use kubebuilder to do your uh, to speed up your controller development. So there is a tool called mTest working underneath, helping you write very distant test suites. So mTest also doesn't spin up kubelets, 
but it, it spares us a lot for your controller testing, right? So, but this kind of two types of uh, tools has this limitation. The first one is has a, uh, has a bar there. It's designed not for end user. It requires you have certain knowledge of Kubernetes. It's SDK oriented instead of API oriented. So you have to use Go to compose this kind of test. And also some of them doesn't have the concept of virtual nodes. For example, M test doesn't give you an extensible mechanism to create nodes, right? So uh, it's just focused on controllers, functionality testing. And also the other more pinpoint of this is it doesn't simulate the full life cycle of the objects. It just start at percentage at a certain stage. So because there's no kubelet backing them. So the part will always be in pending states. And if you create a node, they will always be in not ready status. So it may not fit your testing a lot of other scenarios in terms of scalar test. And for hollow nodes, as I mentioned, it does have the entity to represent the kubelet by the designs, by designs OAM fake nodes and has a not trivial memory footprint. So how Quark resolve all this problem in, all, in one time? So firstly, this is a diagram of the, the classic Kubernetes architecture. So in the right part, if cube is involved, he wants, he doesn't need nodes. It's just a fake node, but not fake node entity, just fake node API objects. You can use cube control to create this kind of node objects. And then when these nodes are get created, Quark will be notified, the Quark controller will be notified, and then do the rest of the work for you to simulate the rest, the life cycle of the nodes, to make it like real ones to maintain the heartbeat with the fake node objects to API server. I will show you later in the demo. Because this is fake node, in Kubernetes design, everything is API objects. So this fake nodes, they exist as API objects. So they will be aware by scheduler. So when your scheduler terms of pass out there, they will be scheduled properly by scheduler. It's just a landing on fake nodes. And also Quark will continue the rest of the life cycle to continue from scheduled states to running states or completed states, you, you name it. You, it provides injective annotation of some other stage uh, term for you to define what kind of rest of the life cycle you will want to this part to go to. So why is it performant? The first thing is that it's by design it doesn't have the concrete entity to represent the cube, cubelet, so it's by design it's one memory footprint. And also internally, uh, it doesn't follow a lot of like controllers design, design philosophy to use informer to keep all the objects in memory. It's more like a streaming processing about the incoming objects. So it just comes through and go away. And then, because of this not, it's not real workloads or not real nodes, so that I don't need to keep the current state in memory for all my lifecycle of the Quark controller. So it saves a lot of memory. So I will show you a little bit of how the memory footprint is, looks like. And Quark itself, as I mentioned in the diagram I mentioned earlier, uh, it has the most core part is the Quark controller. It's aimed for maintaining habits with the Hardware from nodes to API server, as well as paths, maintain the full life cycle of paths, as well as some other objects, and it's tailored designed to optimize mem memory. Also, it comes up with another handy toolkit called Quark Control to help you set up your local testing environment very quickly. So, let me get into demo. So uh, I have a core control. I have nothing running here right now. I have a core control. It's alias for KW. So because for demo purposes, and also I'm running on Mac OS, the most uh, convenient way for me to show you how it works lo looks like is running in the binary mode. So I have pre pre built binary of uh, SD, scheduler, server, control manager. 
So when I created this, the cluster is up. And it also it has the call controller running, running there. So it's too much to uh, get into it. Yeah, this is the call controller itself. It's only 16 megabytes. And the other components is look like Kibab server, container manager, scheduler. So right now, you are running a bare bone control plane. There's no nodes. There's no parts. So let me uh, create some nodes. Uh, you can definitely use Kube control apply a node spec and again, again, to spin up. But here, uh, we have a good toolkit called Core Control to scale the nodes to 20 nodes. But once you run, you have 20 nodes. And how about the scheduling? So I will start from small, and later I will try some crazy thing. So suppose you have deployment, and the replica is 100. As I mentioned, I have a full bevel control plane, so scheduler can schedule that, and then the quark will take over the rest of the life cycle, so I will give it looks like. So not all 100 parts get scheduled on this uh, 20 fake nodes. Also, also one, one thing I forgot to mention is that when you use quark control to create the things, you will read some pre uh, config settings. Like here, I just uh, do some customization on the QPS because I want to push the uh, status, or push the limit of scheduler. So, and then there's a node template here. I just specify 32 CPUs. And the scheduler also, I tweak the QPS to 100, nothing else. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much. Let me delete this. Okay. Next, we will share with you how Unicorn community benefit from Quark. Yeah. Um, hopefully, by far, you understand, you get a basic idea about how Quark. <laughs> It's so different than Kumark, and I will be more talking about from a user perspective because um, uh, I'm from the Unicorn community. What do we do is a Unicorn scheduler, and that has a lot of to do with uh, performance testing or scalability testing. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Unicorn is a standalone Kubernetes scheduler that brings multi-tenancy readiness to Kubernetes clusters. It's being widely used to schedule large-scale data processing analytics and uh, ML workloads. Uh, right now, we, are being, we have been work, operating really large-scale uh, workloads on Unicorn already. Um, so it came with a lot of uh, scheduling capabilities, such as um, hierarchical queues, resource fairness, um, job ordering, um, job preemption, gun scheduling. You may heard many of these terms very, um, very well. Uh, Unicorn came with all those features. Um, and also, it can be very easily integrated into Kubernetes clusters, also with uh, different cloud vendors. Um, actually, a lot of use cases with Unicorn is um, work with um, cloud vendors, uh, clusters, with autoscaler, even with Carpenter. So why performance testing is so important in Unicorn? Uh, essentially, Unicorn is the scheduler, so it, it, it needs to work with every part and node. Um, and do the allocations from part to node. And when we operate on large scale, uh, when we deal with thousands of nodes or um, hundreds of thousands of pods, the throughput really matters or not. Um, and we don't want to run into unknown zones before the users, so we want to stretch to that node. We want to discover like how, how, how many nodes we can scale, how many pods we can scale before that really happens on production. And also the throughput, I think, makes huge difference uh, in terms of the cost efficiency and also the client-side latency. Just an example that if we have uh, 50,000 pods to be scheduled on the cluster, um, just an example, you know, 10 pods throughput versus 20, as a matter of difference, for the customer's users, they'll be waiting for 40 minutes or 80 minutes for if you submit a job at the end of the queue. So that's a huge difference. When we do um, performance testing in the past, before Quark, um, 
this is how we do it. So there are a couple of steps. We build a cluster, we run experiments, we do a bunch of iterations, uh, collect metrics, analysis the results, then we go back to run more experiments because we want to find out what is the bottleneck in the, inside of the code. And uh, so earlier days, so the only, only tool we can use is Kumark. It's an excellent tool. So it basically gives us the opportunity to spin up thousands of nodes cluster. Um, we also develop a tool to do the node simulation and also some tools to collect metrics and um, draw charts. So that's kind of what happened in the past few years. We've been running this for um, three, four times. But why, why only three, four times? Because it's very expensive. Um, Kumark based solutions is expensive in terms of both dollar cost and also the engineering cost. Uh, every time we run um, such large scale testing, we need around 20 physics servers. And in order to simulate like, like uh, 10,000 nodes and the 100, hundreds of uh, thousand pass skill, that is very difficult to set up. And uh, uh, sometimes we need, even need to tweak, you know, each of the server configs to, for example, uh, reduce the, to in, uh, increase the limit of uh, processes or file descriptors, a lot of things to, to work on. And every time, the overall turnover time is about a month and dedicated engineer work on a month to get, off, get ourselves ready for the performance. And it's also extremely difficult to automate. Um, but actually, it, 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 it shouldn't be that hard uh, because in the schedule performance, we, what we really care about is the, uh, the steps in the right box from the pod creation to the pod allocation. And that is where the heavy lifting happening in the inside of the schedule, basically doing the calculation about the scheduling. Uh, we don't we, we, we don't concern that much about the binding phase, and what we really need is the real control plane, but really lightweighted Kubernetes to 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 scale. That that's why Quark is uh, changing everything for us. Uh, so in the past, like I just mentioned, we set up uh, uh, twenty servers to just for the for the performance testing, but now we can do that in one node, even in one in one laptop. Um, Quark can give us just like a way demo. So you can easily bring up a cluster at thousands of nodes to that cluster on your local machine, which is amazing. Uh, and uh, to use Quark, there are basically two approaches. Uh, I've been using both. Uh, I think they both have different use cases. One is use Quark managed cluster. Um, Quark comes with a Quark CTL, which gives you, helps users to bring up the cluster very, very quickly. And what it does is basically bring up the control plane components um, and it gives you the runtime uh, options. Um, what we just demo is using a binary, but also you can use the container runtime, use Docker or Podman, and also you can use Kine. Um, after you have the control plane, you can use Quark's command or spec to create a nodes, any number of nodes, any type of nodes you want. Another way to carry out your test is to bring your own cluster to Quark, which is um, uh, sometimes more useful for us because we want to really test some real control plane. Then we need a real Kubernetes cluster with uh, some of the real Kubernetes nodes. Um, one of the limitations in the previous mode with a binary is that uh, you don't have a even single one real Kubernetes node. But in this case, you can actually have a bunch of them. Um, the choice for the cluster, you can do that locally if you want. You can use kind, minikube, or even desktop if it doesn't matter if one single Kubernetes is, is working for you. And also you can use a remote cluster. Uh, you can basically connect to any, any of the uh, clusters provided by cloud vendors or even on prime. After that, similarly, that core can simulate any number of nodes. Um, also, those nodes are coming with tanks, so you need to make sure your, your application or, or workloads are running with the tolerations and node affinity to make sure that they can run on those uh, fake nodes. So then the environment setup becomes really easy. Set up the Kubernetes, uh, even uh, either use the Quark managed or bring your own, then install Quark, create nodes, uh, then install your app stack, by saying app stack, I 
for example, um, for unicorn, we do install Helm install unicorn, then promises Grafana so we can gather all the metrics we need it, then just start uh, exploring. So there are a bunch of tips. Um, so you, you possibly you want to increase the QPS for control plane in order to uh, really push the, push the cluster to the limit. Uh, also, uh, in some cases, you may want to tweak the node spec to, to the uh, different you know, tabs where you want to cover your test scenario. Then we do like uh, collecting the metrics from the dashboard. Uh, this is the query we use uh, to directly guide the binding rate and also the um, binding pod accounts from, from Prometheus. Right now, there's a Jira in uh, Unicorn community is doing the, uh, we're actually actively working on replacing our toolkit, performance testing toolkit with Quark. And uh, we are even thinking about uh, building a um, pipeline, CSAD pipeline, so we can do the performance testing over and over again to avoid the re performance regressions. Um, Quark is, is a is a perfect suit for unicorn use cases, but I believe it can suit both for many other use cases. If you are doing development um, on Kubernetes, um, either is a controller or application, you can use it for local testing. And because this is so easy to bring up a cluster, to delete a cluster, you can do your local testing very easily. And also, of course, performance testing evaluation. I think I believe this is most of the people will do with Quark. And because so so efficient, um, really we can do a lot of things in one single machine. Another part, uh, we don't talk too much on this talk, but um, I think Quark comes with uh, some chaos engineering capabilities wh where you can randomly inject figures to pod the nodes. Then, um, that, I mean, that is very, very good for maybe 90% use cases for some of the um, common figures. And, then the CSD pipeline, because uh, we no longer need a set of nodes, 20 nodes or more to set up an environment. So now we have the chance to build in, into this, uh, into the CSD pipeline. Um, with the GitHub action, you can trigger this uh, per PR or lightly run. Um, so this can help a lot to avoid uh, performance regression. Also, if you build your, your test cases smartly, you can do that of some of the functional tests too. So I'm going to get back to wait for the demo two. <laughs> we actually have two demos. Yeah, test, test, test. Okay, next we are gonna do some crazy things. So I just show you I create a 20 nodes cluster and with 100 nodes, 100 pass. That is just a toy, right? Let's do some serious thing. So you name it, how many nodes you want to scale up to. Name it. 40,000. 40, <laughs> no, that is beyond the limit. So I don't know if my laptop has support. So basically, on the 5,000, I can, I can give a try. 5,000? OK. So you will, you will need some time. It's because this operation is nothing but issue the cube control create node. But it has some uh, optimization because the default cube control has default QPS limitation, and also cube control doesn't have the list pager. So it basically, uh, oh sorry, this one is now. So I will show you later. Yeah, we'll wait for a while. For I think its rate is like uh, five thousand nodes. Maybe needs fifty seconds to finish. And also, at the same time, I can show you the footprint of memory. So this is the default 1.27 uh, ARM64 binary of API server container manager. So you can see it's a little already increasing. OK, it finished. Good. Then are they running? Nice, 5,000 nodes on my laptop. So next, let's do another crazy thing. How many paths you want to test with? Name it. 10K, 20K, you name it. Maybe we can start with 20K paths, probably. 
And I have an in-house program to measure the throughput. So that is also a tip. When you want to test against your components, you can definitely use metric. But for some specific case, you may need to more fine grain uh, metric collecting logic you want to customize. So this is the, I can open source this. This is just pretty easy. I specify how many I, I forgot. 20,000, right? For this program, it's just watch the schedule pass, and then for every second, it's output D. Yeah, let's get it. 20,000 pass on the 5,000 nodes. Yeah, starting. And same time, let's take it. You can see my CPU usage is spiking, right? And by the memory footprint, you can see API server also, as time goes, I used to spin it up. And let's take it like Quark. Only 200 megabytes in this case. I would expect if there's some kind of cross. <laughs> that is what I mentioned. It's optimized by design that is like streaming processing, so there's not a lot of objects stay in memory for the core controller. Yeah, it gets over, it's okay. Yeah, it's almost finished, I think. Also, you, uh, if you don't care about that kind of fine grain accuracy of your third part, you can also use the default metrics here because I spin up uh, Prometheus locally and then you can use this uh, track. This is the API server track. It's about resource and about the bonding operation, uh, bonding sub resource and the verb is post. That is what default schedule opposed to API server. So, yeah. Because it's the binding rate, that is the, the thing that other simulators cannot do because it doesn't simulate the rest part of the, the life cycle of the part. It's just the schedule phase. All right, that's pretty much, but maybe one more thing is that what if you want to dump the current state of the cluster? Core control also helps you to do that just in one single command. Uh, yeah, that's snapshot, I think. Snapshot export, specify the local cluster name. A filter is filter node and path because right now scheduling only cares about that. And uh, yeah, locally, let me see how soon it can be generated. So basically, it will have a less, oh, super quick. So basically, you'll have 5,000 nodes and another 20K power in total, 25,000. This is in a non-compressed format. It's just nothing but node and part objects here. See, node and then kind power. So yeah, that's it. So basically this can be useful if you want to shut down your local cluster and want to uh, replace some, some else, some, some place else. So, that's pretty much the demo. Yeah, hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, there's a yeah, there's another page. <laughs> so uh, where <laughs> do I go next? So this is the official website of the POC. It's still a pretty young project, just I think in one year. Uh, you can ask any questions in the Slack channel. And also there's two QCon talks related with how you do simulation. Uh, using or not using Quark. And the second talk is, the, I think there's a good point to say, okay, uh, maybe we need some kind of tracer snapshot instead of just one single point. You, you want to snapshot uh, along a ton window so you can catch up, uh, you can catch all the events that happen in a ton window. So yeah, that's all my talk, our, our talk today. And thank you, and uh, if you want to give some feedback, yeah, feel free to scan the QR code. And we have a couple of minutes to take questions. Um, cool, thanks for your talk. This is really interesting. I had two questions. Um, does Quark have any sort of uh, 
API endpoints, like if you wanted to interact with it programmatically no. instead of through the command line? Uh, no. All the API is Kubernetes API. I see. Okay. Yeah. So you'll create whatever you're doing against the real cluster you can do in against the, Got it. the yeah, core cluster. Um, and then does Quark expose uh, Prometheus metrics for any of the nodes or pods that are running on it? Uh, there's some ongoing work on simulated the metrics that Got are it. happening on the node. So uh, there's some details out there, so you can check the website. I, I, I think there is some, yeah, some, some working items ongoing. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I don't know if this is viable or possible, but is there a way of running a service and simulating just a, almost like a hello world text on a page? Can you, is there something like that can you do with, with this to kind of simulate bringing up a lot of web services at a very basic level? Does, does that make sense? If it involves concrete runtime logic, like you said, yeah. dump some up, uh, that needs compute resource. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. is not in the scope of yeah. this kind of testing. But you can bring up the services, can't you? You can have the services and they could point to the pods. They just wouldn't necessarily there do is, anything. There is, is right? uh, items in the community to ensure the service is reachable, yeah, okay. but not runnable to yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. output I see what you mean. that. Okay. So, if you have a pipeline to test the connectivity of the service, actually, Cog can help you do that, but for a long time behavior. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. I think we are out of time, okay. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We can take maybe one more question, and then I will just outside to ask the question. Have, uh, have you thought about supporting other types of workloads, like virtual machines with Qvert? Uh, sorry, could you kind of repeat? So like you, 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 like you showed you pods for yeah. the main runtime you use. Have you thought about supporting virtual machines, like, like using Qvert and, and actually supporting that as a potential support, workload to test scaling? Support virtual machines. Virtual machines. So I don't know what kind of layer you mean by supporting virtual machines. Sure. So like with Qvert, the virtual machine actually runs inside the pod, like it's just a community uh, process. Okay. So, so technically, like, I mean, Qvert has its own control plane that runs inside Kubernetes. Definitely. So I like, guess the, the idea, like kind of what I'm saying is think about it as um, instead of a pod, yeah. like you're, you're, you're sitting around YAML everywhere yeah. to test the control yeah. plane, it would be just testing the virtual yeah, if machines. You want, if you want to test a cube world controller, yeah, exactly. definitely so you, you use the YAML It's a perfect fit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I guess the no way to ask it is like, you can technically support any CRD or API extension yes. to move from a YAML definitely. through the API server to test its yes. scalability. Okay. That's a, that's a very perfect fit for this kind of thing. Okay, uh, I will be outside to ask questions. Thank you, everyone.